thinking. I was 36 years old when I realized that I was white. Now I know what you're thinking. Yes, mirrors do exist, I do own one, and I'm not talking about when I realized my skin color, because I have always known that. What I'm talking about is when I really realized that I was white. You see, I like to listen to podcasts, especially when I'm driving and on my way to work. And I listened to two episodes back to back one morning. The first was an interview with Candace Owens, who is an author and political commentator. And she was talking about individualism, capitalism, and victim mentality. And then the second I listened to was an opposing interview with Kehinde Andrews, who is an author and professor of black studies at Birmingham University. And he was talking about how race as a social construct disadvantages black and brown people in the creation of our societies. Now, these were two incredibly heavy topics, especially at 7 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. But I can tell you then, this for me was a turning point. And it's a bit like, you know, when you're watching a film and you're pretty sure you know how this one's going to end. We've seen this before. And then all of a sudden, plot twist, something changes and we realize we hadn't seen the signs leading up to this, but they were all there. We just didn't know that. But now that we can see them, we can't unsee them. And that film is always going to be that way. And this is what was happening for me that morning. Because in listening to these two black people talking about their opposing views of race and racism, I realized I'm in possession of whiteness. Now, prior to this, I had spent a long time working in the petrochemical industry. And I can tell you, as a woman in that male-dominated environment, I knew how it felt to be excluded. I knew what it meant to have to dig deep and be resilient in the face of the incredibly sexist things I faced most days. So in that context, I had understood oppression. But what I was learning in that morning in my car was how intersectionality influences our experiences as humans. Now, for those of you who are like 36-year-old me and have no idea what intersectionality is, I will explain. So it's a term coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. And what Dr. Crenshaw found was that the feminist movements to that point were advancing the needs of women, but specifically white women, and the needs of black women and the racism that they experienced in addition to everything else remained completely unaddressed. And what this teaches us is that we have to understand that all of the aspects of our identity that make us who we are, we aren't any one of them. We are the combination of all of these things. So our gender, our race, our ethnicity, age, sexuality, all of these things, they can't be uncoupled from one another. So when we are thinking about solutions to the issues that we face in society and we focus solely on one thing, then yes, we probably will make progress but the impact of our efforts won't be distributed equally. And I'll give you an example, because obviously 1989, that was a while ago, surely things have moved on. But this year, the uh, FTSE Women Leaders Review found that the government voluntary business-led initiative that was aimed at increasing the presence of women in board positions, the report published this year found that as of January 2022, the number of women in the top 350 largest listed companies in the UK was 37.6%. So if we imagine, or we don't have to imagine, we know that the population of women in the UK is around about 50%. So 37.6. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's not brilliant either. It's, it's moving. At least it's not 3%, right? Because 3% is the number of black, Asian, and minority ethnic women that make up those same positions. So what we have to understand is, while we are celebrating the advancements of women in business, intersectionality asks us to understand how to take steps to advance the needs of all women in business. Now, I believe the solution to this lies in allyship. 
Now, an ally is someone who may not belong to a marginalised or underrepresented group, but they do hold a, power, a position of power or privilege in certain situations. An allyship is the act of using that power or privilege for the benefit of the group. Allyship is a verb. It's about doing. But doing what? How do we know when we're doing allyship? So this all stems from our frames of reference. And as people, we hold three distinct frames of reference. Me, us, and we. Now, a me mindset, it does what it says on the tin. It's all about me. It's the way in which I view the world, my lens. Me is good for me because I get what I want. I have my needs met. But when all of us occupy a me position, then there isn't really anyone that can truly win. And it can take us into a very narrow way of thinking. It gives us tunnel vision. And it can lead us to believe that in order for somebody else to succeed, I have to give something up in return. But the good news is, as human beings, we can easily get out of a me mindset and we can occupy an us mindset. And this is where we concern ourselves with the views and the, uh, the concerns of people around us. This is our friends and our family. So an us mindset is how we create community and connection. And it brings us safety and friendship. And I mean, it sounds good, right, doesn't it? Who doesn't want to stay in the us mindset? But the trouble with this is our human brains have a very real preference to avoid differences. So who is it that we are most likely to be surrounding ourselves with when we are with an us mindset? It's people who are exactly like us. And this is where polarization can creep in. Because when we surround ourselves with people who are just like us, we are creating an echo chamber. We're surrounding ourselves with people who reflect back to us our thoughts and feelings and behaviours, and we pass them between one another, reinforcing them. It shapes the news that we consume. It feeds our social media. We give it likes, we tell the algorithm what we want, and it gives us more of the same. It drives that wedge between us and people who are not like us. And it takes a real and conscious effort for us to challenge a me and an us mindset and to get up in our helicopters and to occupy a we mindset. Because we is where the creativity comes from, where the innovation comes from. It's about understanding other people who are not like us. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. It is uncomfortable to get into a we mindset because it requires us to understand who we are and make an effort to understand people who are not like us. It requires us to understand that we will have had certain advantages and opportunities that other people won't have. It requires me to acknowledge that I worked really hard to get to where I am today, to this very spot. But I didn't face the same barriers that other people will have done. So let me give you a, a real-life example of this and how this might play out. I am a cisgender white woman. This is my me mindset. And on the 8th of March, every year, I will attend events for International Women's Day because I believe that's important. But inevitably, these will also be rooms full of other cisgender white women, all talking about the shared experiences of being cisgender white women. This is me in the context of a group, in an us mindset. Now for me, these are great days out. I have a wonderful time because I feel seen and heard, and my experiences are validated. But again, we've created that echo chamber because we are just reinforcing our feelings on things. I am preaching to the converted in those events. Everybody knows what those challenges are. So in order for us to move to a we mindset, Allyship requires that we invite black women and trans women as speakers to these events so that we can understand their position, that we represent the needs of disabled women, LGBTQIA plus women, neurodivergent women, all women. 
But allyship is also about men. It's about welcoming men into these spaces so that they can reinforce their mindset from their journey from me to we. Not as speakers, I should add, but as listeners, as supporters and champions of the challenges that women face and people of other genders so that they can become better allies. Because this, this act of allyship, this is how we drive change. But this is also where the paradox exists. Now, a paradox is something that is difficult or even impossible to understand because it has two distinct facts or characteristics and they will be in opposition. And the paradox of allyship is that it requires us to understand exactly who we are in the context of me and it asks that we act in opposition of that sometimes for the benefit of people who are not like us. And there is a really good reference to this um, in the book Both and Thinking by professors Wendy Smith and Marianne Lewis. And they talk about a paradox as being a trap that we can fall into, where we believe that there are only binary solutions to problems that we face. So either it's this or it's that. Either it's good or it's bad. Either it's good for me or it's good for them. But what they encourage us to do is to occupy both and thinking. They ask us to look for solutions that fall outside of the, the binary and, and to seek more innovative solutions. What are the ways that exist where it can be both good for me and for them? So what did I do as a 36-year-old woman for the very first time discovering her whiteness in her car that day? Well, in that moment, I understood that the only thing I could ever understand with absolute clarity and with absolute 100% certainty is what it's like to be me. And everything else I would have to learn. I continued to listen to podcasts. I read books. I used the internet. I attended many uncomfortable events where I had conversations with people who were not like me and I listened to their experiences, and I believed them when they told me about the harm that they had experienced. I understood that my actions in the past will have caused harm to people who are not like me. I used all of this learning that I had brought together in my personal and my work lives, and I used this in my journey to be a better ally. Now, I understand at a time when our society is becoming increasingly polarised, the motivational drive to stay in a me and an us mindset is high. Because it's safe. It's secure. We are surrounded by people who will look out for us and we will look out for them. But allyship requires that we do the uncomfortable internal work for the external results. So my ask of you today is this. Push back against that motivational drive. Join me in our helicopters with a we mindset. Let's think about what's good for everybody. And let's use our understanding of our own privilege and our own positions of power to make decisions that benefit everyone. Because allyship is about knowing and having the courage to stand up and use your voice when other people are not able to. Allyship is about knowing when to step aside and to use your platform for the benefit of others. And allyship is about knowing when to step back because your voice is not required at all. Because allyship is a verb and it is what will move us from me and us to we. And this is how we unite. Thank you.